Okay, hello everyone. Nice to meet you all. My name is Ahmed. Today I'll be speaking about the sun that will rise from the west and the companions of the riser. The riser here referring to the Mahdi, to the savior of mankind. So before I go into my presentation, let me first give you a brief of who we really are. We believe that there is a savior in the end times. We believe that we are living in the end times. We believe that the savior has to be here because the earth has been filled with injustice. This is our faith, this is what we believe in. Now, let us look at the Mahdi, the savior of mankind in the eyes of the Muslims. Muslims, whether they're Sunnis, whether they're Shia, they believe that he would be an Arab. This is what they believe, he's gonna be an Arab and mainly address, addressing the Arab world. They believe that his companions are predominantly Arabs. This is what they believe. And they believe that he would be appearing from the Arab world in specifically Mecca. In this presentation, we will, we will be seeing together if this really applies or not. We'll be looking at a lot of religious scriptures, narrations. So we will be going a bit in details in the religious scriptures. So, since we are living in the end times, there's a very important narration Muslims believe in. One of the signs of the end times, the sun rising from the west. This is a very, very important narration. Let's have a look at that narration. The messenger of Allah said, the hour. Here, the word the hour in Arabic means as-sa'a, which is referring to the end times. The hour will not be established until the sun rises from the west. Now, this is our topic today. The hour will not be established until the sun rises from the west. So if the people see it, they will believe in it. And that is the time when no soul will benefit from its faith as long as it had not believed before. There is a, a condition here. So if the people see it, which means some people will see the sun rising from the west, Others will not. Now, this is a question. How come the sun rising from the west and not everybody seeing it? That's a very important question we should ask ourselves. And also, if we look on a scientific level, this is impossible. Scientifically, if the sun is going to rise from the west all suddenly like that, that would cause extreme hurricanes extreme earthquakes, extreme winds, extreme waves, which means everybody's just gonna die. That's doomsday. So let's, we should ask ourselves a question. What does it really mean? The sun rising from the west. Now, I'll just say straight away, the sun is a divine messenger. Instantly you will tell me, where did you get that from? So, if we look at the Holy Quran, it says, when Joseph said to his father, oh my father, indeed I have seen in a dream 11 stars, the sun and the moon, I saw them prostrating to me. It is very clear here that God Almighty speaks in parables. The sun is referring to a person. Also in the Old Testament in Genesis, 
chapter 37, verse 9, it says, Then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun, the moon, and 11 stars were bowing down to me. Very obvious that the religious scriptures are referring here the sun to be a person. Back at that time, it was Jacob who was the sun. He saw the son, Jacob, prostrating to Joseph, peace be upon him. So now we can see, we can slowly, slowly hear from the religious scriptures, understand when we say the, run, the sun rising from the west, it is referring to a person. Also, here, again, Jesus, in John chapter 8, verse 12, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He is clearly referring to himself as the sun. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in, dark, in darkness, but will have the light of life. Even Jesus at that time, he was referring himself to be the sun. He, the sun is a divine messenger. It's not something literal. So based on that concept, the Mahdi, the savior of mankind, is now the sun. He has to be the sun because the sun is a divine messenger. We'll be looking now at a narration from the family of Muhammad. The prince of believers, peace be upon him, said, referring to Imam Ali, peace be upon him. He's saying here and the sun, he's referring here, and that is after the sun rises from the west. So here, Imam Ali, the prince of believers, is talking about that narration that we're talking about. After the sun rises from the west, at the time repentance is lifted, and repentance is a, and no repentance is accepted, and no work is lifted, and no soul will benefit. Here, someone went to one of the companions of the prince of believers, Imam Ali, and asked him, what did the Prince of Believers mean by this statement, the sun rising from the West? He said to him, the one whom Jesus, son of Mary, peace be upon him, prays behind, it's the 12th of the progeny, 12th of the progeny referring to the family of Muhammad. The progeny of Muhammad means the Ahlul Bayt, means the family of Muhammad. He's the 12th Imam. And he is the sun rising from the west. This is a clear narration from the family of Muhammad referring that the sun is rising from the west, referring to a person. So the signs of end, one of the signs of the end times means here a person who's gonna rise from the west. Let's take a look at another narration here. The Messenger of Allah said, it was said, when will he come out, O Messenger of Allah? Here, the Messenger of Allah, someone was asking the Messenger of Allah about the Savior of mankind, about the Mahdi, about the Riser. When will he come out, O Messenger of Allah? He said, he will emerge from the West. Very clear statement. With a mark on his leg, a mark between his shoulders, as a stranger. It was said, how will he be a stranger, O Messenger of Allah? Why is he a stranger? How? He said, because he is separated. He is separated from his family and estranged from his homeland. Now, the family of Muhammad here is trying to state clearly that it's a person who's going to leave his home country and go to the West. Let's look at another narration. Imam al Qadim is one of the successors of the family of Muhammad here. Was asked, we have narrated that the Mahdi, now it's becoming more and more noticeable, is talking about a man. Mahdi is from you. The Ahlul Bayt means the progeny of Muhammad. So when will, he, when will his rise be? And where will he rise from? 
He said, the example of the person you asked about is like a pillar that fell from the sky. Its head is in the West. So that person will be in the West, that person he's talking about. And it's his origin is in the East. And we will see who is that person. So where do you see the pillar rising when it rises? I said, from its head. He said, it is enough for you that he rises from the West. So the Mahdi will be rising from the West. Not like what the Arabs are thinking, mainstream Muslims. Mainstream Muslims are thinking he's coming out from Mecca. But the narration is stating completely the opposite now. So he said he's going to be rising from the West and his origin is from the East. And it is there that the rise will be established. Let's look at another narration. Narration after narration after narration. The Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him and his family, who said, there must be a riser, a riser here referring to a savior, the Mahdi. There must be a, a riser from the sons of Fatima, from the lineage of the family of Muhammad, who rises from the West. It is now noticeable that he is coming, this person, this figure, this holy figure is coming from the West. Now, he's not just talking about the person, he's talking about the banner of that person. And this is very important. It was mentioned that the Mahdi, peace be upon him, and he said, the banners of the Mahdi appear from here, and he pointed his hand to the West. So not just the person and his banner, is gonna appear from the West. Let's look into another narration. The Prince of Believers, Ali ibn Abi Talib said, now we need to focus on that term, especially the companion of Egypt. Here he said the companion of Egypt is the sign of signs. If he emerges, know that the Mahdi will knock on your doors. So before he knocks, fly to him. You need to fly to him now. Fly to him in the domes of the clouds or come to him even if you must crawl on ice. Now let me ask a quick question here. When you think of the Mahdi rising from the Arab Peninsula or the Gulf countries, do you, do you imagine that people would be crawling on ice there? Or just sand, desert? This is what's happening in the Arab Peninsula. So this is a phrase, a sentence that means that to go to the Savior, the Mahdi, you have to crawl on ice, which means he is in a Western country that has snow and ice. This is why they said, even if you have to crawl on ice. Now, history is repeating itself here. How? The Israelites, at the time of Moses, the Israelites, they were expecting a savior to come from amongst them. They expected Moses to be speaking fluent, fluently in Hebrew. They expected that person, that savior figure to come understanding their culture. They, they did not expect him to come from a different place. But in reality, Moses came from the palace of Pharaoh. And they thought, the Israelites, they knew that Pharaoh was an oppressor. So they, it was too difficult for them to accept Moses as a savior back then. As history, back then, uh, history now is repeating itself and I'll explain to you how. They expected that this savior figure will be speaking fluently Hebrew, though he was speaking Egyptian. Now, in this day and age, God sends a savior from America. Exactly the same. History is now repeating itself. God sends a savior from America. He's addressing the whole world in English. This is why 
it is very difficult for the Arabs to comprehend the fact that this Mahdi is not, why is he not speaking in Arabic? It's because he's a Mahdi, a savior that come, came from America. And they're not, of course, expecting him to be coming from the West. Now we can see clearly how history is repeating itself today. The Israelites back then are like the Arabs today. Now, we looked at the narrations speaking about the sun rising from the West, referring to a man. Now let's talk about the companions of the Mahdi. The companions of the riser, referring here as the Mahdi, are mostly non-Arabs. And this is very interesting, extremely interesting. We will look at the narrations first. The riser, referring to the savior, in Arabic means Qa'im. Qa'im means the riser, which means the Mahdi, the savior. The riser shall rise with a new matter, a new book, and a new jurisprudence which will be hard for the Arabs. It's a very, it's crystal clear narration statement by the family of Muhammad that he will come with a new matter that will be difficult on Arabs. With the riser, another narration with the riser, peace be upon him, from the Arabs are few. And we will go into the details why it's difficult and Another narration, if the riser emerges, there shall not be between him and the Arabs and the Persians. It's being very detailed here, the Arabs and the Persians, except for the sword. As we saw in our dear sister Hadil's presentation, the amount of persecutions that happened to the Iranians and the Arabs. Why? Because when he emerges, the riser, there will be issues between him, the Arabs, and the Persians, and it was clearly stated by our dear sister Hadil in her presentation. The Prince of Believers also st stated, as if I am seeing the non-Arabs putting up the tents in Al-Kufa Mosque and teaching the people the Quran as it came down. This is a statement from the family of Muhammad that the Quran is distorted. The Quran that the Muslims have today is not the real Quran. Is it, it's the distorted one. Why would they be teaching the people the Quran as it came down? Unless this book, the Quran that they have between their hands is di completely distorted. Another narration, how will you be when the companions of the riser put up the tents in Kufan Mosque and bring out the new idea, the new matter, which is difficult upon the Arabs? Now you can understand why it's difficult on the Arabs. It is very, 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 very clear why it's difficult on the Arabs. Speaking about the house of Mecca is not the house of God, that's enough by itself. It's just enough to tell them this is not the house of God. It's for Arabs, they just can't take it. You cannot speak like this. Another narration, the companions of the riser, there are 313 in number, exactly. 313, the close companions of the riser are 313 men, the son of the non-Arabs. Now, all, those, all these narrations about the Mahdi that is coming from the West and his companions mainly being non-Arabs are only fulfilled in this call and that religion. There is no call on earth that has Imam al-Mahdi from the West and companions, mainly non-Arabs, except this religion and this call. All those narrations, those religious scriptures have been fulfilled here, only here. And we will see that together now. Do you remember this narration? And there he said here, he rises from the West and his origin from, his, from the East, Abdullah Hashim. Now let's look at Abdullah Hashim, Abu Sadiq, from him is peace. He's American. He lived in Egypt. He lived in Egypt in the East. 
and then he migrated to the West. That's why he said, it is enough for you that he rises from the West and his origin is from the East. He lived in Egypt. 2017, he migrated and went to Germany. And it is there that the rise will be established. And this is why you see us here in Europe. So this prophecy has been fulfilled. Another prophecy, because he is separated from his family and estranged from his homeland. He did leave Egypt, he left his, all his family. All his family, his friends, relatives, he left them and went to Germany, from Germany to Sweden and from Sweden to the UK. That's also had been fulfilled. Also, remember this narration, even if you must crawl on, on ice, has been fulfilled. Why? Germany, Sweden, UK, if you want to go to him, you have to crawl on ice, even if you have to crawl. Of course, this is like a metaphor. You're not going to literally, but it's a sign to show you where the Savior will be. Where is the Mahdi, even if you have to crawl on ice. The riser will rise with a new matter, the seventh covenant. This is a new matter that happened. And a new book, the goal of the wise. And a new jurisprudence. This is exactly what's happening today, which will be hard for the Arabs. Go to the Arabs today and tell them, hey, no hijab, no hijab. They, uh, that's, tell them alcohol is permissible. Alcohol is permissible. Hijab, you don't have to if you don't want. You just don't want. Oh, uh, you don't have to pray the five prayers today. It's been lifted. Oh, the month of Ramadan, you're not fasting. Uh, you're wrong. You're completely wrong. Oh, the, the house of God. This is not the house of God. Oh, the Quran is distorted. Oh, 99% of Islam is distorted. It is extremely, that's why narration stated, only very few from the Arabs. So that has been fulfilled, which is now why you understand why there's a lot of persecutions in the Arab world, in Iran, and this narration stated the Arabs and the Persians. With the riser, peace be upon him, from the Arabs are very few, and you can see that clearly. Very few Arabs and a lot of non-Arabs, and you will see even more and more, when you meet the, the, the companions of the riser, you will meet them, you'll see them, you'll understand that those narrations have been fulfilled on us and only us. Now, the companions, they come from all corners of earth. We have different cultures. You have Egyptians, we have Americans, Mexico, from all around the world with different religious backgrounds. Some people, they were atheists, by the way. Some people were, of course, Muslim Sunnis, Shias, Catholics, from all different religious backgrounds. But we all came together, together and we were united under the banner of the supremacy of God, which is what? Which is God only has the right to choose his leader, his king, which means allegiance to God, allegiance to Allah. This is what united us all. And Abdullah Hashim, Abu Sadiq, is the son at this day and age. He's the son. At the time of Jesus, it was Jesus. At the time of Jacob, it was Jacob. Solomon, it was Solomon, and so on and so forth. So at this time, it is now Abdullah Hashim, Abu Sadiq, He's American that lived in Egypt and migrated to the West, and we all gather for him. Companions, they come from all around the world. Ethiopia, Colombia, Malaysia, Sweden, Switzerland, Egypt, Italy, from all around the world. Kenya, Thailand, Montenegro, Slovakia, Slovenia, Korea, Portugal, Peru, Kurdistan, Uzbekistan, Azerbaijan, Yemen, Venezuela, from all around the world. Just one thing that united us is this man. This one man that had been appointed by God, by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, from 
because he was mentioned in the will. I want, we will watch together a short video of the companions of Abu Sadiq, the Mahdi, the savior of mankind, and how we live together. And you will see clearly that they all come from all around the world from different countries. Let's have a look at this video. Un, dos, tres, un, dos, tres, probando. Un, dos, tres, un, dos, tres, probando. Imam Mahdi has come in these end times and he has come to fix the world that is broken. Imam Mahdi's supporters are many. They come from different countries. They speak different languages. They are both men and women, all of different ages. They are of different races and cultures. Their backgrounds were all different. They did not grow up hearing the same ideas or learning the same things, but they all have one thing in common. They all found the savior of humanity today, Abba Sadiq, the door to Imam Mahdi. We are all so different from one another, yet we understand each other so well, even better than our own blood families. Speaking different languages and coming from different backgrounds doesn't make a difference to us since we all have the same goal and this keeps us united under one roof. And all of this started years ago in Egypt. Amar ibn Yasser said in a long narration where he describes the events before and around the time of the rise and the people of the West go out to Egypt. Who knew we would be part of this great prophecy? Imam Mahdi doesn't come for one person, or one nation, or one religion. He comes for every individual living on this planet. And he comes with a covenant that is for everyone, no matter where they are or where they come from. Abu Sadiq made it so easy to believe that the world can be made into a better place. Imam al-Baqir, peace be upon him, said, The companions of the Qa'im are 313 men, and they are children of the non-Arabs. Some of them are carried in the clouds during the day. They ask, why don't your women wear hijab? Why don't you practice orthodox Islamic rituals? It's because Imam Mahdi comes with a new matter, a new book, a new jurisprudence. Imam Mahdi and his answer are here with a purpose and a goal. And this is to bring mankind to a place of justice and equity. That means that the goals of God today are much higher than to be concerned by simple practices and rituals. I know you don't expect someone like me to say this because I'm not your everyday scholar, but I need you to understand Imam Mahdi is here to save the world. The truth is, there is only one place left on earth where God himself can truly be known, and that is through his vicegerent, who is Imam Mahdi. And you cannot reach Imam Mahdi unless you walk through the door. And the door of Imam Mahdi is Abdullah Hashim, Abba Sadiq. We, as the Ansar of Imam Mahdi, have seen so much of God's greatness that it is absolutely clear to us that we can make this world a better place. Abba Sadiq has shown us how much God is supporting us. And we have no doubt that this mini paradise that we have built together can be expanded and spread till everyone can be a part of us. We are part of God's prophesied plan and it's happening now. Do you want to be a part of it? Thank you very much. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you. And now, Mr. Ben. All right. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, and thank you for having me. And thank you for uh, to all involved in organizing the, the conference or the gathering. Um, uh, before I sort of respond directly to some of the comments uh, or the presentation, uh, I think I'm still thinking about the last session, too, and sort of one of the fundamental takeaways, which is the broad sort of um, confusions about the basics of your movement, uh, of your religion. So I thought it was very helpful for you to go through sort of the, the fundamental sort of uh, effectively messianic claim. Uh, when I was first invited to the um, uh, to attend here, the first thing I did, of course, is I, I Googled uh, because I was curious. And the Google response is completely wrong, of course. The, the first group you find are the Ahmadiyyas, who don't have a direct, a direct connection as far as I'm aware. Uh, and then you find Wikipedia pages filled with, with this and that. So it's it's helpful to hear directly from you what, um, what the fundamental positions of your movement are. Um, 
So I study uh, comparative religion and new religious movements in particular. So as you were talking, I was sort of scribbling down ideas that um, that jumped out at me in terms of the other religions which uh, which I've looked at and that I've studied. Um, if uh, if I were to sort of to broadly think to sort of classify how I'd understand uh, your religious movement, and I should you know state from the from the outset, as I think uh, Maslow mentioned as well, my job is not to uh, uh, to support or, or reject the particular theological claims, but to understand them. Um, the the first category I think would be messianism. Uh, the, the central claim is about the Messiah, and therefore we can put your movement into conversations with other messianic movements, uh, recent and historical and ancient. Um, I'm really struck by the end phrase from the video you just uh, showed us. Uh, we are part of God's prophecy plan. Um, from a sociological or a psychosocial level to think about the attraction to new religious movements, um, the desire to be part of something bigger is one of the things that sociologists have found uh, in, in the study of, of new of new groups. Uh, that speaks so directly to it. Uh, the, the need for humans for meaning in their life is likely universal. I mean, we're also aware of making universal claims, of course, but we can probably make that one. People want to feel like their lives have meaning. People want to feel as if um, uh, there's, a, there's a purpose to all of this, hence religion. Um, and I think that the individual who was speaking in that video really hits the nail on the head in terms of indicating the attraction of your movement uh, to, to them. The idea of there is a prophecy plan and I'm part of it and I could be part of building this yeah. world. Exactly. Um, again, I, 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 again, I put it in the comparisons to other movements. I was, uh, I was interviewing a, um, a unificationist member of the Unification Church um, last year uh, who had joined back in the 70s who talked about that was their primary attraction. You know, they, they couldn't make it through the divine principle, but they, which is the, the book they had. But, but he was attracted to the idea of saving the world. And then later he read the stuff. Um, so I guess one of the questions I have for, for you or for members of your movement is to what extent do when people, when people join your movement, are they, are they driven by the particular theological claims and to what extent are they driven by sort of the social side of wanting to contribute towards making an almost utopian community, uh, to, towards that world transformation? And I realize it's an artificial distinction because it's likely a bit of both for most people. But what is the pull? What pulls people in? Is it that they want to make sense of confusing sacred texts? You know, the Quran says this, the Torah says this, the New Testament says this, I want to make sense of it. Is it that... People want to grapple with sort of deep philosophical questions about Plato and Aristotle and Socrates. And is it that your movement speaks to part of their heart? The idea of this is a way to bring the religions together. This is a way to build something bigger. This is a way to uh, to resolve tensions in the world. Or is it, of course, a bit of both for different people? But I'd be curious. It'd be impossible without doing a large social survey as for, of course, interviewing everyone. Uh, but I'm curious what your sort of your, your gut reactions are. What brings people into the movement? Is it... Is it theological ideas? Is it the group? Is it sort of the social dynamics? Is it sort of the, the emotional, uh, spiritual sort of uh, emotional experience of it? Um, those are some of the questions which which jumped out at me. Hold on, I have to look back, back at my notes here. Um, I was really interested in your, um, what I would call your exegetical method, the, the exegesis. I'm using a Christian term here, but um, the idea of exegesis and then hermeneutics relatedly is how do you read and interpret texts? Um, so it's very clear to me that the interpretation of texts is, is central um, to, this, uh, to, to your religion and to the practice. And I'm curious, therefore, about um, how sort of in lived religion in everyday practice that plays out. Um, do members of your religion spend a lot of time in textual study? Um, and if so, of what text? Is it primarily of the new text produced within your movement, or is it looking at older texts and interpreting them in light of, uh, of the newer texts? Um, is the canon open to which I say, since there is a, a living leader uh, and a living uh, mighty figure, will there be more sacred texts added in the future or is the canon now closed? Uh, again, thinking comparatively, uh, I, I'm North American, so I think of the example of the Latter-day Saints or the Mormons who have an open canon technically, but it actually is very seldom added to. So the, the, the Book of Mormon is sort of the main one. And then slowly over the last, you know, hundred something years, the Doctrines and Covenants gets added sort of a little bit at a time. Is that perhaps analogous to what might happen here? But again, these are questions I have, which only you and members of your movement can answer. Uh, uh, finally, I'll, um, uh, uh, I guess I, I, the... Um, the question of sort of the universalism 
uh, is interesting to me, the way in which you so, so very clearly indicated that the Ahmadi religion of uh, peace and light moved beyond the Arab world. Um, that, to me, again, like this, the great successes actually of, of Islam before that and Christianity and Buddhism, all of which proffered themselves as universal religions appealing to everyone. Um, I can see sort of the, the attraction, the draw of that and the way in which that would work to sort of create sort of a, a, a diverse community. Uh, I'm struck also by the, uh, <clears throat> by the engagement with social media and with, uh, with contemporary technology. Uh, when I, um, uh, when I sort of was poking around online, I was, it was very clear to me that your movement is very fluent with sort of the, uh, modern technology and with using every aspect of social media more so than I am. I, I have to admit, I don't, I don't use TikTok at such much, but I could, I could find stuff there when I was looking. Um, and I'm curious to what extent the sort of the, the big theological ideas you're talking about are conveyed into sort of the social media as well, or if that's really more something for sort of scholars to think about. But again, these are all questions. Uh, these are just my questions. I'm sure you all have questions, too. So, I just loaded you with the bunch. So <laughs> pick and choose or actually ask them because their questions are as good, if not better, than mine. Okay, so let's start with the first question. Yeah. Which was just... Um, Messiness was what I was thinking about, sort of the, the, the role of the, uh, the, the central... You were saying, I, I, any, what attracts the people? Yeah. Okay, uh, first of all, since the Imam al-Mahdi, the savior of mankind, is coming for everyone, what does this mean? It means that he's going to come for everyone. So it's not religious texts only. Every person has his own relationship with God. God is going to speak to you through his own way. Some people believe because of religious texts. Some people believe because they saw a vision. Some people believe because of the knowledge that, 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 that uh, Abdullah Hashim Abu Salik is speaking. So there is no specific way with God. God is open with everyone. If I say, God, you have to believe, believe through that way, this means that I've, I've closed the door on everybody. And if you're not going to believe through that direction only, this means, well, I'm just, uh, you know, a sect. And that's the only way. If you're not going to believe this way, that's it. But well, it's not the case. He's, he came for everyone. The savior of mankind came for Muslims with all the sects, Christians with all their sects, Jews, atheists. We are the only religion on earth that accepts LGBT, right? LGBT, we are the only religion. Unitarians. We are the only that accept. Which means, which means we accept everyone. Go to any Muslim country and tell them, oh, this person is, you know, he, he has a certain, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's gay or so on and so forth. That uh, No, we accept everyone. So the savior of mankind opens his arms for everyone, not just through religious scripts, so, uh, scriptures. So this is for... The first question, answering your first question. Otherwise, he, he cannot name him as a savior for mankind. He's for everyone. Everybody has his own, like, um, you know, his own link with God. So God's going to speak to you through your own specific way. The way I believed 12 years ago is not the, the same way where, for example, my dear sister Alex believed. The way I believed is totally different than how he believed. So we all, at the end, believe, but through our own ways with God. That's why it's very important to have a relationship with, we say there's a relationship with God. And there's a very important phase that I learned from the savior of mankind, Abdullah Hashim al Sadiq. He said, if you want to be a scholar without love, know that you're going to misguide the people. Because number one for us is humanity. Humanity before religion. Humanity first, then comes religion. This is a true savior. A true savior will think of people before religion. Uh, Basically. Yeah, thank you for, for this explanation. Uh, when you were speaking about this uh, uniting people under one umbrella, uh, another uh, movement, uh, your religion, came to my mind with Baha'i. And I was thinking how much you have been uh, considering that uh, religion when, uh, when uh, 
developing your your uh, doctrine. And uh, the other question I have was um, what comes from this classical sociological theory about pluralistic orientation. I wonder how do you see in this uh, vision of uh, this end of times, which would be the just time, is it... Uh, is there a place for other religions to coexist with your religion in that period? The answer is yes. That's why he came for everyone. Mm -hmm. So they can continue practicing their... Religion. Slowly, 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 they will be introduced. Like, for example, now we have Muslims, for example, Muslim Sunnis. We have the Muslim Shias. We have the Catholics. We slowly, slowly introduce them with the truth. And slowly, slowly, they themselves will see that what they were believing is, has some truth in it, but the, the whole truth is only with that figure, Abdullah Hashim. So yes, the question is yes, but slowly, slowly, they will be coming into uh, religion. There's also Sister Hadil. Yes. Yes, so um, as a faith, we believe in uh, freedom of religion for everyone. So uh, even uh, so, yeah. when you were, we were talking early in the morning about the uh, multiplicity of being 124,000 prophets and messengers, so um, one of the things that's written in the narration about the riser that um, at times he even uh, rules or judges with jurisprudence of other religions, and that in itself, and also like we're saying, the imam has already. Um, verified or affirmed that many uh, establishers of previous religions were actually prophets and messengers. So as a religion, uh, for sure, we believe in everybody's right to practice their, their religion and they will be given that space and will um, be allowed to exist and practice their faith uh, freely. So freedom of religion and belief is an integral part where um, everybody can choose and practice the religion that they want to believe in whatever they want to believe. Maybe you have to answer there from the LGBT. Yeah, can you just be also, okay, you can go ahead. Yeah, yeah. so um, most of the LGBT, uh, it's, um, we don't interfere in people's private lives, so the religion as a religion welcomes everyone. everyone. Yes. And um, after that, it's between men and God, so that's a private matter. Mm -hmm. uh, Exactly. Uh, I have a question. Uh, in uh, you say that uh, there, uh, God always has vice chairs on earth. Yes. So in the last say uh, thousand years or so, who was was the twelfth Imam in hiding? Mm. Because you have uh, Muhammad, presumably you have Ali, and you have the Imams. Yes. And then uh, these people we know. Yeah. Then now we have uh, our son, and you have your the founder of your religion. But that leaves a big gap. So during this big gap, uh, who was the vice chair of God on earth? Was it the 12th Imam in hiding or somebody else? No, he was never hiding. Uh, this is what they, the non-working scholars, they always preach to the mainstream Muslims that he was hiding. No, there was always a messenger that was sent in every day and age. Uh, today, Abdullah Hashim, he is a messenger from Muhammad, son of son of Muhammad, son of Hassan Askari, peace be upon him. He's a messenger, exactly like the Quran. Some of them were mentioned and some of them were not mentioned. What's important that throughout those thousand years, yes, there have been vicegerents and messengers sent, but at this day and age, it is Abdullah, it is Abu Sadiq Abdullah that have been sent forward. Before him was Imam Ahmed al Hassan from him is peace. And now it's Abdullah Hashim, to, as you can see, talking to everybody and making videos and talking to everybody. And he is the messenger from Muhammad ibn al Hassan. So he's not hiding, is not what. Uh, no, no, but the question is, for instance, in the year 1500, who was. Uh, uh, no, no, look. It, we, don't, we don't know. But there, there should have been some vice. Generation. There were, there were, like previously, before uh, uh, Imam Ahmed Hassan, it was someone with the name Aba Ahmed. But at the at the end of the day, even 
the names will, even if I tell you it was that person, his name is Aba Ahmed, it was so-and-so person. Yes, they were, but like, I don't know the whole from like the name, exactly name after name, because also in the Holy Quran, it was, some of them were mentioned and some of them were not mentioned. Yes, so I think it's really important to make a distinction about the term that was used, which is the 12th Imam in hiding. And I think this is kind of an orientalist term that kind of has negative connotations because why would a religious leader figure have to be in hiding? And actually what the narration state is the Arabic word layba, which means he's in a state of occultation. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the people have rejected God's appointed messenger. And I think his appointed vicegerent and the leader who is equipped to lead humankind into that utopia that we're talking about. So um, the idea that the 12th Imam wasn't in this position is because there were certain prophecies that would have to be fulfilled before his return at a time where he would have the number of supporters needed to build the divine just faith. So I think the idea is that the 12th Imam has been over this 1,200 year process since uh, Imam met, since, uh, sorry, the, uh, uh, in that period after the Prophet Muhammad, mm -hmm. he has been uh, in that occultation, mm -hmm. waiting for the right time as per prophecy, which I again will talk about uh, before he re emerges. In, in the 1990s, correct? Oh, forerunner. Okay, forerunner. Okay. Okay. So, until, yeah. Okay. I will actually go through very interesting hadith uh, narrations. That would, I think, be helpful for those who are not members. A nice segue. is confusing. Yes. Okay. So, we're going to transition. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Thank you.